My name is Al Kucher. I was a second lieutenant navigator assigned to a B-24 crew. It was late 1944, November of 1944, that our crew reported in with five others that we had trained with, with the 456 bomb group in Stornara, Italy, the 15th Air Force. Pilot to crew, we'll be touching down in Greenland shortly to get some chow and some rest. On the tower, Army 233, a flight of B-17s over Bluey West 1. Landing instructions, please. It was always a, a sort of a running little side joke, which was better, the B-17 or the B-24. The B-17, to me, was better constructed, and they could go higher. Uh, we uh, were faster and could carry more, and that was essentially the difference. The B-24, I th think, uh, didn't sustain damage as well as the B-17. And uh, although they made more B-24s than uh, any other aircraft, some 18,000 of them, as I recall, uh, they, uh, as long as they got us up and back. Our unit was made up of four squadrons. Major Gail Clevin was the commander of the 350th. He and Major Egan were the unquestioned leaders of our entire group. Ev Blakely was a pilot from Seattle. Look who it is. Blakely. And big heart of Benny DeMarco from Philly. DeMarco? Hell of a landing. See you, Mars. That uh, impressed me. It reminded me, really, of uh, our crews, our people. They were 19, 20, 21. If you look at the record we had in our bomb group uh, publication, and you'll see it's of their ages, they're all that age. And uh, it was a young man's war in the air. This is a holding pattern while we figure this out, Cross. Roger, stand by. Turn right to 165, over. Roger. Turning right to 165. It was difficult. You're very limited with the uh, tools you had to work with as a navigator. Uh, you had your drift meter, a B-5 drift meter, uh, airspeed indicator, and a compass, uh, basically, and you went with that. But. Uh, I always felt comfortable when I could use pilotage, which was just go by the map and follow it as much as I could and keep track of the movement on the map and uh, using a dead reckoning with the information, just keep our track this way. But cloud coverage was a, a pill because uh, you didn't have much else to go by initially. We had a, a club, if you would call it that, where we, we could eat. And we had a little bar, but it was just a, a thing about as twice as wide as this, and maybe it, uh, a little longer than this. But that was our club. There was drinking. Uh, I wasn't much into drinking or anything back then. Nothing like not that I am now, but. Uh, Again, we didn't go into town. We didn't have pubs near us or anything like this. Cherignola itself was uh, eight, ten miles away from us, and I think I only went in there three times, if that. It wasn't much. There was a USO there, and I don't remember much about it. But uh, there were no women around our area at all, anything like that, for a year. B-17 
easy deal. Jack it up and hook it up. I'm on it. Let's go. You know, the thing that uh, you didn't address, or they didn't address much here, probably, the faith you had on some 18, 19-year-old kids that were ma maintaining those airplanes. Even after I got out and was flying myself as a pilot, and you stop to think of these youngsters that were probably just working on a hot rod car before they went in the military, and they're taking care of these uh, turboprop engines and tearing them apart and putting them back together. A lot of faith in a lot of young kids, really, and they did it and under terrible conditions, even in peacetime here, where they had to work to maintain these aircraft at the base. I, I keep thinking of Dover, where uh, we had so many aircraft, 133s, 124s, 141, and uh, how they maintained them is amazing. The target for today is Bremen. <laughs> We'll be hitting the U-boat pens on the Vesa River. Now, I cannot stress enough the importance of this target. Yes, the briefing was uh, pretty much like what they showed there. It was pretty much your t run into the target. Any uh, flack along the way, places to avoid on your route. Uh, England into Germany was a very short distance. We had a long way to go. We'd have to go up the Adriatic to a great extent and probably grow in, go into northern Italy, Yugoslavia, before we got into uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Austria, or Germany. Uh, then we'd get over the land area up there. Have you seen on my lap till I move? Ready for the checklist. Form 1A. Check. Fuel transfer valves and switches. Both transfer valves are off and switches off. The intercoolers are cold. Gyros. Oh, yes. Those, uh, as a pilot, uh, checklists were important. You, you didn't want to forget anything. Uh, again, I can only exp uh, state that from my experience as a pilot, but uh, I think they followed it very closely. It was a procedure, it's the easiest thing to get things done and not miss anything. There were always a lot of little switches to push, you didn't want to miss any. Left gears up. Tailwheel up. Okay, Bosser, let's get you in the hole. I was given a very good picture of a ball turret, and uh, so I asked an old friend, and he said, hey, his ball turret gunner would like something like that, so I sent it down to him in Texas, and, uh, but he called it the smallest church in the world. Pacer lead, this is red meat lead, we've lost engine one. Can't maintain this pace. We're headed back. Copy, surface lead. Red meat deputy, we have mechanical failure. I'm heading back. Lead is all yours. Roger, we'll go. Actually, our crew experienced it uh, once, maybe on our second mission, really. We were g going up to uh, Odertal, which is in the north, up very close to Oswegium and Auschwitz. The Odertal refinery was up there. Our second mission, the first few missions, you flew in a, with an experienced co-pilot. And as, as we got up uh, just about the initial point, I guess it was IP, uh, they reported a number four engine uh, was failing. And we fell out and we flew back on our own. We joined up with another group on the, that was on its way back, as I recall. I don't know which group it was. Here we go. 
Flak incoming. Hold on, boys. Motor crew, Flak. 11 o'clock row. By the time I got there, we didn't have to contend with the fighters like they did. They had fighters and Flak. Ours, uh, at least from my personal experience, it was Flak, if that's all. And uh, there wasn't uh, much discussion about it. Uh, you're going to see Flak, and that was it. And you, I guess, you see it when you see it. And that was it. And uh, our uh, tail gunner, I always got a kick out of uh, Vic. Clayton Vickery was our tail gunner. And you'd be on the run, and old Vic would be in the back in the tail yelling, uh, flock. And, and be in the tail, he'd see it. And as it got closer, his voice would get a little higher. <laughs> and uh, good old Vic, you Massachusetts boy. The heavenly host, and all the evil spirits. Holy. Wander through the earth, seeking the root of souls, amen. And I was standing up there when the flak hit the Astrodome, and I dropped down real quick. And uh, our co pilot told the told lady, Yeah, it was funny. We saw you drop down, and when you came back, you had a big grin on your face. I was telling him, Whitaker, we were at 25,000 feet. I had a oxygen mask on my face. How did you see that? <laughs> they got Adam. Oh, no. No. They got a bail. Adam, bail out. Anyone see shoots? Tail the pilot. I don't see any shoots. Roger. Keep calling out those fighters. Going into the target, you had a flag you could put on like you see the hair of now. And it was many years later I realized that uh, our chutes were packed, chest packs that hooked on to clips. We didn't ha have a chute that we wore during the whole mission. This was just a parachute pack. And I realized that. A lot of the difficulty was when the aircraft went down, reported was centrifugal force. They got in it and uh, they have trouble getting out. And with, I can't imagine, I was thinking, well, I have that flak vest on. How was I going to get that off and put a chute on to get out? Tail report, Dickie. <clears throat> Ah, tail the clubbing. Fighters were gone. I only see two left from the 349, sir. Three forts were gone. The first time I had to release the bombs and whatnot, and uh, I was up there doing that, I took my glove off. And all I had was a, a little, was a uh, nylon glove or something. And my hand really froze. It, I say froze. It got really cold. And uh, uh, I was kind of yiping because of that. But uh, I can see if you touch the metal that, uh, and I was, I was pounding on the turret of the, for what reason, I don't know what to do, the nose turret gunner, because he couldn't do anything. But my hand was really cold. And it, it defrosted naturally. It didn't get any freezer burn or anything like that. But. The uh, thing you would notice, though, after coming down that from a mission, you would have a white line around your oxygen mask, where it kind of froze up a little of moisture or so, something like that. And, and I don't know how those gunners in the waist, I guess until they got a plastic uh, covering over that window back in the waist, I must have been cold as all get out. Yeah. Need to get you to interrogation bunk. Come on. Didn't drop a single bomb. I had to salvage them over the channel. I know. Yeah, I was uh, uh, 
wondering how you, in that section, how you missed the part where he said they didn't drop. I didn't hear that part. But uh, they did drop bombs in the channel, and I imagine on occasion uh, some of our bombs were dropped in the Adriatic also. Uh, again, there was a, always a concern of landing with a bunch of 500-pound bombs uh, in there, and you're just, they're just on that shackle. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I can appreciate that they would, could have done that and get rid of them. Why didn't you tell me? What? You've been up. Two missions. You didn't tell me it was like that. I don't know what to say. You've seen it now. Yes, I didn't uh, have, I, I think our training before going overseas, where we trained as a crew, as a group, of, uh, flying in Boise, Idaho. We were there for two months, I guess. And we were flying, there were a lot of B-24s, and we'd go up in bomb group formation. We'd be attacked, so to speak, by either the Army Air Force or the Navy. They had some Navy fighters up around Klamath Falls, Washington, and they would come into some of our routes and uh, attack us. And so that, from that point of view, uh, I think we were as prepared as we could get, you know, and, and until the shooting starts. Seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Our crew was one of six had trained together in Idaho, and we reported into our squadron, the 456, on six by trucks at night together. We were six crews. Three of those six went down. The uh, fourth uh, crew lost their bombardier, little Gabby Hartnett, their bombardier, uh, one of the first few missions, flew with another crew and he went down and became a POW. So, uh, again, outside, our crew was very fortunate. Yeah, I got pretty en engrossed in it, and uh, I thought it was, I was there. I was listening, and uh, I recognized the debriefing uh, and the rest of this stuff. Uh, so uh, it was good in that respect, yeah. I think, as they say, you got in there, you felt a responsibility to one another. It really what it was. We had a very good crew, good, good groups. And it was amazing how after we came back into the States, with the B-24 and 45 and landed in, in uh, Connecticut, it just dispersed like a burst of flak. We landed and poof, everybody disappeared and went. And uh, never saw a lot of them again after that, the crew members, uh, at least on our crew.